chapter. Titus 3 <laughs> says, Once we too were foolish and disobedient. Look at that. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. I want to start by asking you a couple questions this morning. First and foremost is, what do you hear? What do you hear or what do you think of when you read that scripture? What goes to your mind? What does it mean to you, what we just read? Do you believe what you read? Do you believe what you heard? Does it even resonate with you? Can you see yourself in the scriptures we just went through? Because I know when I read this, when I, when I looked at it for the first time, I'm reminded of my life in Jesus Christ and, and how he's personally taken upon himself to change me. And how I, I, I've changed so much over the years. And there's still a whole bunch more change coming ahead. And I know he's got things in store for me. And I know eternity is set up for me, however that may look. And so I know all that. And he's got things planned for all of us like that. And maybe you can agree with me as well when you read that scriptures. Maybe you can pinpoint events in your life where you've seen that transformation of the Lord move and do things. You've seen the result of the kindness and the love and the mercy of God all playing out in your own life. And as you look forward to what the Lord has planned for your future, maybe you have thoughts and plans for that as well as you read that. You see, I, I, personally, I personally resonate with that scripture. What Paul talks about there is how we were once foolish. I was very much foolish. And so this passage seems to like just speak to me already in regards to how Jesus has changed me in my life. And for the most part, I would say that we all gather together for that same reason. We could agree on something similar to all of that. And why not? After all, that would appear to be what Paul is writing about here. However, when you look at the bigger picture of what Paul is actually writing to Titus about, you'll see that this part that speaks to you or me individually, it plays in on a much larger picture that we need to take a look at. And you know, Titus is a very interesting letter. And it's classified as a pastoral epistle for all the Bible school students here. It means that it is one of the three letters that Paul wrote in regards to pastoring churches. The other two were First and Second Timothy, and the third one is Titus. And these pastoral letters, they discuss issues of Christian living, doctrine, Leadership, as well as they give advice on matters of church, government, and discipline. That's what a pastoral epistle does. And it's basically this leadership manual that Paul's going to give out to those who he leaves in charge of churches everywhere he goes. And regardless of how many years it's been since Paul wrote this in the year 65, this letter is still applicable today. No revision or update is needed. It's fully complete as is. So as much as we, we look at this verse in Titus, and point to ourselves about this verse, and, and we, we, we want to own it, it actually has a much broader picture, and something that's a lot more relatable today than we may realize. You know, when we look at the world we're in right now, when we look at the world today, and how our younger generations, or even our current generations, are responding to God and to church, you're seeing a divide. We see a divide. And, you know, values are changing Lifestyles are changing. Definitions are changing. And this shift is happening. And we don't need to even look at the statistics to see that either. All we have to do is just, you know, look at the communities and watch to see how many church doors are being closed or how many are on the verge of closing. Or, or take it one step further, step inside and look at the church and see how many generations are missing from these different churches in our communities. And we'll see that the demographics aren't as healthy as they once were. Let's, let's take it to a different level altogether. The percentage of people in our community alone who would find themselves associated with the Christian church is probably under 10%. 10% of our community's population, what are we, 20, 25,000 people here? Do you think if we combined all the churches, we'd find 2,500 people in church today? It's a long weekend, probably not, but you never know. And the thing with that, though, 
The, thing, the way we handle this, the way we respond to that understanding of that missing generations, of those missing demographics, of that missing percentage, is this, is this trend we seem to take. How do we make church more attractive to people? How, how, how do we trick them into coming to church? How do we reach the masses? How, how do we connect with those who are not in church? And what can we do to make church more desirable for them? And we really focus on that as church growth. I heard it put best this week. It says, we count butts and bucks, or nickels and noses in the church. And I thought, how appropriate that seems to be is how we value church attendance, is how we count. We're very focused on that style of church growth. You know, and when you look at things, it's a very viable and realistic question. How do we grow the church then? Especially knowing that we're commissioned by Jesus himself in Matthew 28 to go and preach the good news and make disciples. The hard part with that, though, is, is how do we do that, though? It seems so easy when you read the New Testament. They're just going out and doing stuff. And it seems so hard here because we've got all this other stuff to do as well. And, you know, especially because we know where we live. And, you know, where we're at, most everybody's heard of Jesus already and they've, they've had encounters with church or Christians that haven't been too favorable sometimes. And, you know, the bride of Christ has almost given a bad example to who our Savior really is, to who the, who the groom, the bridegroom is. And surprise, surprise, it still happens. I know it's happened to me. It's probably happened to you as well. It, it, it's out there. So typically when we respond to that question of growth, what do we do? Well, let's do a building upgrade. Let's rip out the ceiling and, and put up some nice lights. I like that. It works. Why don't we have good music? Why don't we have program after program after program? Why don't we have outreach? You know, let's do a men's group. Let's do a teenage group. Let's do a youth group. Let's do a, a women's study. Let's do all these things which are good, which are valuable, which are needed. But is it filling the void? Is it, is it fixing what's wrong? Or are we just throwing glitter over the model we already have thinking we're changing it? You know, we haven't even looked at the real reason why the church body of Christians isn't really growing. Because it's not. The church body is just changing venues. And that, that's the reality of today's church growth. When somebody's numbers goes up, it seems like somebody else's numbers go down. And that, that, that's just what's happening. Especially post-COVID. You know, if we could just look around the room, how many new Christians would we count? New as a believer in the last 12 months last 24 months. Oh, we can even go 36 because COVID really made a, a real big crimp on that. This is almost a standard we're seeing in churches as well. Where's the growth? Where's the salvations? Where's the word of God being shared? Are you following me? So the reality is, none of that glitter really matters to what really needs to be done. And none of that applies to the scripture we've just read, does it? Think about it. Did any of that bring you to Jesus? It may have brought you in a church door somewhere, but that's not what brought you to Jesus. So why do we expect that to work now? It was definitely not what brought me to Jesus. It was a log building in the middle of the nowhere. It was by a lake, and there was not very many people there. And there was bats, and it was stinky. Anyways, the rather thing that changed us is this reason we can resonate with the scripture. The exact same thing which Paul was telling us. God's kindness, his love and mercy, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what changes us. And not because we did something, but because God did something. Because God saved us. And his Holy Spirit empowered us to change according to his word and his ways. You know, Paul starts off the third and final chapter of this letter reminding Titus and us of this and how to live as Christians. After all, like I said, it's a pastoral epistle dedicated to teaching us how to live and behave as Christians. And Paul has spent the first two chapters of this letter teaching Titus how to handle the issue that was at hand. And the truth is, Titus had his hands very much full with those who called themselves Christians already who were on this island of Crete. And it was those who were calling themselves Christians but not living it that took away any value, any meaning, or purpose to the Christian faith at all. And the question for those who Titus would have to minister to and lead and deal with became, what's the point? What's the difference between what we're doing now and what Christianity brings? Because it really seems to be similar. 
And because of the culture that was there, there was this blending of these habits they had. You know, these religious practices that they'd known were being blended with Christianity, and they were calling it good. And so Christianity became useless. It became pointless. And it's with that understanding and that similarity that we can see that reflection in our society today. And that very issue that Paul wrote to Titus about, about how to fix it, is the exact same thing we need to look at in our society as well if we want to see a culture change and if we want to see the church grow with new believers. If we want that. So before we go any further into the scriptures, we're going to take a look at the word here. We're going to see what this issue was like in Crete. We're going to take a moment, we're going to step back, we're going to look at what was going on. See, first of all, Crete was this large island, and it was just off the coast of Greece, and it had many significantly placed harbors around it. It was a hub. It was one of those central places that everybody in that area went to. It was a huge trading area, and so Crete was this place that drew people to it. It drew everybody to it, including Paul, to start these churches or to fix these churches. The problem was Crete was indoctrinated with Greek culture and mythology. And they believed that the Greek gods were just mere men and women that were actually elevated to deities because of their, their noble works and, uh, and just their serving mankind caused them to become gods. They, they also believed that the, the gods were born on this island. That this, was, this was their home. And they believed that Zeus himself was allegedly buried here on Crete. And so this place became this central place of worship for the Greek gods. And they, they, they just inhabited that lifestyle. And they can have that culture and that reputation and that was influenced by all of them, by how they worshipped these gods. And these gods were known to have bad behavior. And Zeus, who was known as, as the god of these gods or the father of these gods, was the one they idolized the most. And he was also known as a womanizer. He was known as a liar and for being cruel and vengeful. And so this was the lifestyle they copied. This was the lifestyle and the culture that Crete embraced and they were known for this place was known for its treachery, its violence, its sexual corruption. And there were, there were these, these people were hired out to be mercenaries because of this lifestyle they had created. And, you know, I don't know about you, but with that understanding of Crete and that lifestyle of those who live there, I can draw parallels to where we are today simply because of those values and the lifestyles in society now. And I can tell you that every aspect of what we're dealing with today, every aspect of what we're dealing with today would be found on this island. But that wasn't the case for everybody there. Because of the greater, well, the greater majority of the population lived there, but there was this, this large Jewish population there as well. And most likely it was these Jews who had converted to Christianity is where all these church problems Paul had to address really came from. After all, these Jews were most likely during their trip to Jerusalem for the Passover, encountered Peter giving this, this amazing message at Pentecost, which we're going to look at in a couple weeks. But they, they were the ones who, who would have heard this message from Peter, and they would have given their lives to Jesus, because when you go through the list in Acts 2, Crete, the Cretans were one of the people who were there. And so they heard this message, and they would have taken it back home. And they would have just started living how they knew as a Jew, with what they knew as Christianity, and, and then all the, the Greek culture in there. And so there was this mess. And we're not given much else for details on how things came to be. But somewhere, these churches in Crete, and somehow, they got set up. And they came under this influence of these corrupt Cretan church leaders who called themselves Christian. And they thought they were Christian. But they were ruining the church. They were ruining the church's name. They were, and they're just making it bad because they never lived or acted or led like a Christian should. And so... Paul assigned Titus with his task to set things straight, and this letter provides him with instructions. Man, it would have sucked to serve with Paul. He sends you off to do all this hard work. Well, he just writes letters telling you how to do it. I'll have to try that, Jardeth. This is a quick breakdown to what is going on behind the scenes. You know, so you know what they're dealing with, so you know what's going on. You know the culture. You know the background. You know what they're dealing with. And this letter was really just was addressing that. And like I said, I think we can appreciate it if we look at it just so much more from our idea, from our understanding, and how it's very relevant to every church today. And there's a lot, there's a lot we can take out of this letter. After all, Paul addresses a lot of things as he's basically instructing Titus on how to change the culture and how to influence the people. And we're definitely in a culture right now that wants influence of people. So Paul starts off this letter reminding Titus that this message of an apostle was his as well as ours. It is this message of hope for eternal life that we need to share. And that this is life 
for the new creation of a believer is available right now. You know, right off the hop, Paul says that this hope for eternal life can be yours right now. But it's through Jesus the Messiah and not through your gods that lie. Because Jesus does not lie. He is faithful to all that he says, does, or will do. And actually his followers are supposed to be like that as well, he says. Despite what you've already seen in these churches, he says, his followers are supposed to be like this. And so Paul starts off Titus 1 by saying, this letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I've been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them how to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now is just the right time he has revealed the message, this message, which we announce to everyone. It is by the command of our God, our Savior, that I've been entrusted with this work for him. Before Paul even starts to address anything else, he makes sure of a couple things. First and foremost, he makes sure what? Christ and eternal hope is preached and that God is true to his word. Right off the start, he makes sure that's known. And then we start to read this letter. We see that, that Paul gives Titus this direction to start replacing all the old church leaders with these new leaders. And Paul is very specific on who these people should be. And he sets this standard very high. And these were just appointed leaders. These weren't people with education of, of Bible school. These weren't people with a lot of scripture education. These were just normal people who were attending there, just like you, just like me. They were just people who were going to these church, but... They need to be known for a few things. They need to be known for their integrity, their generosity, their self-control, and basically everything opposite of this Creek culture they were in. Opposite of those who were already in church leadership as well. They need to be someone who could also preach the good news, and these are godly standards we find in the Word of God. And, and Paul then points out the failings of those who were in charge beforehand. And he draws this divide saying, this is what is expected and this is what's not accepted. And he's creating this new church culture that's focused on two things. Godly attributes and godly behaviors. He instructs the old and the young and even those who are slaves how to be, how to live, how to act, how to respond as a Christian needs to respond, how a Christian needs to live. You know, Paul is teaching these churches how to be Christ-like while still living in this culture that was so full of this Greek mythology and Greek customs and, and Greek life. He's teaching them how to live and not to live separate off to themselves, not to isolate themselves apart from that culture or everyone else either, but to still live in this evil world, as he puts it, with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has been revealed bringing salvation to all people. It has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Verse 15, you must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone disregard what you're saying. Just stay true to God, true to his teachings, and follow him. Do you hear what he is saying? Can you relate to it? You know, Paul's instructed Titus how to, how to basically grow this church and how to create this godly Christian culture that's going to, what, transform everyone it encounters. And I just want to highlight them one more time before we get into that final verse, the one we started with. How, how do you grow the church? How do you change the culture? First and foremost, Christ and eternal hope of salvation. His gospel must be preached and shared all the time by who? Those who believe it. And second, the culture of the church leaders must be one that is recognizable as attributes and characteristics of God as well as teachable. And thirdly, that all those who call themselves Christians and go to church should continue to live in this world relying on God for his wisdom and living righteous lives dedicated to Jesus and to turn from godless living and sinful pleasure. And when that happens, when the community you live in sees that, 
when they experience it, when they know it, and they hear that good news shared by those people who are living a life worthy of the gospel they represent and they believe to be true, which Paul writes in Philippians 1.27, when we live like that, then Jesus Christ will be revealed to them. And not only that, it's going to open the doorway for those wanting to attain it and to be corrected how they live, to, to how they should live. And the Oz, Oz has made that sound. We want that. We want to be corrected by God. We want to be changed. You know, discipleship starts, or it needs to start actually, the moment we come to know Christ. The moment a new believer comes to know Christ, that's when discipleship needs to start. You know, but it's funny though, because we want to accept everyone to come just as they are to church. We want the church to be filled with sinners. We do, because we're all sinners. And we want them to come just as they are. You know, that's the grace of God, and that's good. But we forget that we also need to direct we need to teach, and we need to correct them as well. We need to love them and not let them stay where they're at. And just as those who came to know Christ in Crete had to throw off the old gods and the old ways because they were blending their beliefs with their new faith, we'll do the same thing if we don't do that. We need to be doing that exact same thing that, that comes when we find Jesus and that freedom and that hope is we need to be corrected. We need to correct those with love, kindness, and mercy, as we heard. And that's what we want. That's what we all want. And there's a freedom that comes with that. When we hear, or when we receive the truth, and that truth was going to change us and free us, the gospel, the gospel frees us, or at least it should. And so now that we're all caught up to where we're going with this and what it's all about, I want to look at that, that scripture we started with again. Except this time, with the knowledge of knowing what Paul is actually writing about and why it has any bearing on anything we need to know. So Titus 3, 1 says, Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. Whew, good thing I ended with that one. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, when he revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace... He made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit our eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. Oh, so all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. At the start, I asked you to internalize the scripture, to internalize that scripture, and I asked you, what do you hear? Or what, what do you think of when you hear this? Where does your mind go? What does this mean to you? Do you believe what you read? Does it resonate with you? And the question I ask you now is, do you hear something different? Do you hear something different now than you did at the start? Because I do. When I first read that scripture, it was all about me. What God did for me. And what he will do and where he will take me. It was all about me, 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 what he's doing, what he's going to do, where he's going to take me. All this stuff was focused on me. This time, however, when I read it in understanding with this letter to Titus, I see something a bit different. I see myself as part of the church. And the church is made up of all these individual believers joining together wherever they're at. But they all have a common purpose. They all have a common interest, a common theme. And that is Christ and sharing that message of his gospel. And as Paul put it in, in verse 1, one, I have, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. The thing with that then is when God's truth is preached, lived and heard, it does something to those who are around it, regardless of where 
or when we live. What was true then is still true today. And this whole understanding of what Paul and Titus were trying to achieve and do was to transform this island of Crete into a godly place. And not by going in and overpowering and being religious and having revivals or trying to create this user-friendly environment. They just went in but allowed the Holy Spirit to do its work in one life at a time. By following God, by living godly practices and not trying to change the culture, but penetrating the culture by living for the Lord and allowing that truth to be seen along with sharing the gospel of God to everyone they could. And when those two things are combined, watch out. Because change will happen. And it won't be because the church has glitter on it, I can guarantee you that. It'll be because the church has Christ and his truth in it, and it's actively living out what it believes. And see, that is the implication of this. You know, this is what Paul reminds us about in these last verses, that that we we were all messed up at one time. We were all not right. We too were foolish. We were misled. But through the kindness, love, and mercy of God, and with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and his word, we changed. And so can others. And that still applies to the world today. It's true, you know, this world is a messed up place. It's dark, and it's gringy, and it's just nasty sometimes. And that's, that's the truth. But you know what? We don't have to conform to that life at all. And we don't have to conform to that culture around us at all. Yeah, and we want to avoid it. And we want to protect our families from it. We really do. But, you know, that's not exactly what we're called to do, is it? Do we believe that the gospel is powerful enough to transform someone into a new creation? Do you believe that the gospel is powerful enough to transform someone into a new creation? Do we believe the scriptures we've read? Well, if we believe it, then we believe that the power of the gospel can and will transform someone to change into this new creation who will then become an agent of change as well within the culture they're in. Who will then help change that culture as well. It's a domino effect. And it's not easy. And it's not fast. And sometimes it's really not pretty. But it's real. It's the truth. And that is the power of the gospel. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of his word transforming us. You want to see a church grow? You want to to see a generation or two return to the Lord? Do you want to see new believers find their way? Let's take a lesson from Titus. Amen, sister. Let us live out God's truth in our own life as an individual first. Let us worry about ourselves first and getting right these things that Paul's listed off. And then when we do that, when we gather together as a body of believers, as the body of Christ, watch out. Watch out and watch God change the people where we live. But it's going to take work. And it's going to take time. And the truth of that is it takes one major thing. Paul's very much reminding of us all the time. Romans 10, 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Do you want to grow the church? You want to see people saved? You you want to change the world? Well, it starts with one person. It starts with you. And all it takes is sharing God's truth with one other person and living a life that reflects that truth because that's what's going to grow the church. That's what's going to change lives. That's what's going to impact friends. That's what's going to bring the family members who are lost back home. That's going to change the loved one's hearts. That's what the world actually wants and needs. They don't need more glitter. We don't need more glitter, although we can work on the foyer later. But we just need God and his truth. The very thing that transformed you will be the very same thing that transforms everyone else. And when we start living like that, when the church starts living like that, let us look at the book of Titus come alive in our generation. And let us get ready for that change. But that is if you want to grow the church. That is if you want to change the culture we find ourselves in. And just so you know, So we're all on the same page. I want that. This church wants that. Do you want that? Or are you just happy with the glitter? 
I'm going to leave that with you. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to sing another song here. So Father God, I thank you for this day and for your word. I thank you for this time that we've gathered together. Lord, I don't want glitter. I want you. I want your word. I want your truth. I want your transforming love to change me continually, Father God. I'm not happy as I am. I want more. Father God, I also want to share that with all those around me, one person at a time. Father God, give me the encouragement this week to do just that. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be right. You know, sometimes we even border on theology questions of whether we did that or not. Father God, just give us the boldness to share the truth of who you are and what you've done in our life. And let us trust your Holy Spirit and let us trust your word and let us see what we can do to this community and this culture we live in. And let us transform it by transforming ourselves more and more like you. Hear him pray, Jesus. Amen.